Hey everyone and welcome back for another deep dive. Today we're going all the way back to ancient Greece and explore a figure who might just hold some surprisingly timely wisdom for us, Epicurus. Now when you think of ancient Greek philosophy, you might picture those classic stern faces debating grand ideas, but Epicurus, he offered something a bit different. Imagine a philosophy centered around happiness intriguing right it really is i have to admit when i first saw epicurus in our lineup my mind went straight to epicurean you know indulging in fancy foods luxurious things but the sources you sent paint a different picture that's a common misconception epicurus's idea of pleasure wasn't about fleeting indulgences at all it was far deeper than that he saw true pleasure as tranquility finding freedom from pain both physical and mental and cultivating a deep sense of balance in life so it's less about indulging in every desire and more about finding contentment. Precisely. There's this great quote from Epicurus that really gets to the heart of it. He who is not satisfied with a little is satisfied with nothing. In other words, constantly chasing after more actually prevents us from experiencing true happiness. It's about finding joy in what you already have. I love that. It's like a completely different operating system for life, especially in our world that's constantly telling us we need more, more stuff, more status, more everything. Do you think his ideas on pleasure connect to how he viewed death? Because that's something I know he's famous for. You've hit on a key connection. This idea of inner peace ties directly into how Epicurus tackled one of humanity's biggest fears. Death. Right, I even have a quote here somewhere. Uh, let's see. Ah, oh, here it is. Death, therefore, the most awful of evils, is nothing to us. Now, how can something so universally feared be nothing to us? It seems paradoxical, doesn't it? But Epicurus had a very logical way of looking at it. He argued that when we're alive, death is not present, and when death arrives, we're no longer there to experience it. It's the fear of death, the anticipation, that causes us suffering, not death itself. So are you saying he encouraged people to live recklessly since death is inevitable anyway? Not at all. It wasn't about ignoring death, but rather understanding its true nature to free ourselves from that fear. That way we can embrace life more fully right now. That makes sense, but how do you actually apply that? It's one thing to understand it intellectually, but another to internalize it. You're absolutely right. It's about shifting our perspective. For example, think about how often the fear of death, or even just the fear of things ending, limits us. It might keep us from pursuing a passion, taking a chance on something new, or even expressing our feelings. Epicurus would say, why let that fear control your life? It's like he's saying, hey, you're already living on borrowed time, so make the most of it. I like that. Exactly. It's about recognizing that the present moment is all we have, so we might as well savor it. Now, this might be a good time to transition to another interesting aspect of Epicurus's philosophy, one that you found thought-provoking, his views on the gods. It was a bit unexpected, to be honest. From the sources, it seemed like Epicurus wasn't exactly what you'd call devout. To put it mildly, Epicurus challenged the conventional ideas about gods and their role in our lives. In fact, he even questioned their role in human suffering. You're talking about what's known as the problem of evil, right? I have to admit, I had to brush up on that one a bit. Essentially, it's the question of how a truly benevolent and all-powerful God could allow suffering to exist. It's a question that has been debated for centuries. And while we could go down that rabbit hole all day, I'm more curious about how this skepticism about the gods influenced Epicurus's philosophy. It really boils down to personal responsibility. Epicurus didn't believe we should just sit around waiting for the gods to solve our problems or make us happy. There's actually a quote that encapsulates this perfectly. Mm -hmm. It is folly for a man to pray to the gods for that which he has the power to obtain by himself. So it's about taking control of your own life, making your own happiness, rather than relying on external forces. Yes, it's about recognizing your own agency in shaping your life. And honestly, this idea feels incredibly relevant even today. Think about how easy it is to feel overwhelmed or powerless in the face of everything happening in the world. Epicurus reminds us that we always have a choice that we can choose how we respond, and that we can take action to create a life we find fulfilling. That's a powerful message. You know, one thing I found really interesting in the source material was how much emphasis Epicurus placed on friendship. He even went so far as to say that it was the most important thing for a happy life. What did he mean by that? Was he just talking about having people to hang out with? Not quite. For Epicurus, friendship wasn't just about having fun. It was about cultivating deep, meaningful connections that could truly enhance our well-being. So what made friendship so essential in his view? Well, think about the qualities of true friendship. Support during difficult times, someone to celebrate with, honest feedback, and a sense of belonging. 
All of these contribute to that sense of tranquility and freedom from anxiety that Epicurus valued so highly. It makes you wonder if he was onto something there, especially in our world today where loneliness and social isolation are becoming more and more common. Exactly. His ideas feel surprisingly relevant to the challenges we face in modern life. It's like we've come full circle. We started with the pursuit of pleasure, but for Epicurus, it was about so much more than just fleeting gratification. It's about cultivating inner peace, finding contentment, building meaningful connections. Would you say that's a fair summary of his philosophy? Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. And you know what really drives that home for me? This quote from the sources. He who says either that the time for philosophy has not yet come or that it has passed is like someone who says that the time for happiness has not yet come or that it has passed. That is a great one. It really makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah, it's like he's saying that searching for happiness and pursuing wisdom are timeless, not limited to a certain age or a certain time in your life. It's always relevant. Absolutely. And I think that's what makes exploring these ancient philosophies so fascinating. You know, here we are thousands of years later and Epicurus's ideas about, like you were saying, finding joy and simplicity, cultivating inner peace, building meaningful relationships, they still resonate so deeply. Yeah, it really makes you realize that even though the world has changed so much, those core human needs and desires, they haven't really changed all that much. Not at all. Well, this deep dive into Epicurus has given me a lot to think about, that's for sure. It's not every day you come across a philosophy from, you know, ancient Greece that feels so relevant to modern life. So thanks for taking this journey with me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's always so rewarding to see how these timeless ideas can still offer guidance and inspiration today. And for you listening, we want to hear from you. What resonated most with you about Epicurus's philosophy? How might you incorporate some of his wisdom into your own life? Let us know. We're always up for a good conversation. Until next time, keep those minds clear. Through the storms and the floods, I'll hold my ground. While others fall, I'll never back down. If a heart is steel and a will so strong, I'll stand tall. I'll see you guys. Instead of craving final harmony The memory of everything overwhelmed in time In the rock valley we find the climb Do not indulge in dreams Wrapping up the blessings true In the rock rhythm find what's in you Read with diligence Not a superficial sound In the rock first let the wisdom resound I won't be shaken I won't be swayed See, most people don't understand what's in you, the presence of God that makes you more than a conqueror. That's what's in you, God in you, your hope of glory. To manifest that, you got to step out of line. You want to be successful, watch successful people and do what successful people do. And so I'm saying to you, 
You have something special. You have greatness in you. Do what works. You know, I was at this event. And this guy spoke and, and he was so boring, he just put me to sleep. The room was as quiet as a graveyard between funerals. They gave him polite applause. And I said, man, that guy was boring. Well, I didn't know I was seated next to his brother-in-law. And his brother-in-law got a little attitude. Said, well, you ought to be that boring and make the kind of money he made. I said, well, how much he made? He said, $5,000. I looked at my watch. I said, he only spoke for about 45 minutes to an hour. He said, that's the kind of money they make. I said, whoa, I can do that. Some of that money's got my name on it. Have you ever seen somebody do something and you say, whoa, if they can do it, I can do it. If you're going to make it today, if our children are going to have a future, we got to do what these young millennials say, stay woke. This is the time to step up. This is the time to be actively engaged in finding ways in which you can use your talents, your abilities, and your skills to build a place for yourself in this new economy. When I was fired from radio, I had to find another way to use my talent, to use my voice to take care of my family. I had to be willing to learn something new. If you do what works, then that is follow the money. And if you're willing to learn something new, the possibilities are unlimited. Careful who you marry and even more careful who you have kids with. Victory over others gives strength. Victory over oneself gives fearlessness. I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. Richard P. Feynman To lead an orchestra, you must turn your back on the crowd. You might regret your speech, but you'll never regret your silence. The key is you have to trust that God only has the best in store for you. Nick Vujicic Income do I want for the future? Where would I like to go? Places I'd like to visit? Habits I'd like to acquire? Skills I'd like to have? Economics? Friendships? People you'd like to meet? When you've thought about what you want for the future, Make a list. If the future gets clear, the price gets easier. Because you got to remember, for every promise, there's a price to pay. Everybody's got to pay the price. Everybody's got to do the deal. Everybody's got to do the disciplines. But here's what I've discovered. If the promise is clear and powerful, the price is easy to pay. The price is some classes. The price is a few books. The price is a few disciplines. The price is finding something that'll make your life better, make you grow, make you change, make you develop. So the first part of the key is to design the promise. Then what is the price to pay? I'm telling you, the price will be easy. If you'll make the promise of the future clear for yourself, all of the values of life that you could possibly want and be serious about it. I promise you it's an easy price to pay. Anybody can pay it. And the best advice I can give you is if I can do it, you can do it. Start setting your goals and see if you can't get a better excitement going for the things you want to accomplish for the future. One of the major reasons for setting goals is for what they make of you in achieving them. My teacher advised me when I first got started at age 25, he said, Jim, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? I'm here to help you. And he said, here's why for what it will make of you to achieve it. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve it. So part of the key here is to set the kind of goals that will make something of you. Don't set them too low so that you don't have to grow and you don't have to... But you, neglecting, neglecting to do the commands of the general, complain when anything more hard than usual is imposed on you and you do not observe what you make the army become as far as it is in your power, that if all imitate you, no man will dig a trench, no man will put a rampart round, nor keep watch, 
nor expose himself to danger, but will appear to be useless for the purposes of an army. Again, in a vessel if you go as a sailor, keep to one place and stick to it, and if you are ordered to climb the mast, refuse, if to run to the head of the ship, refuse, and what master of a ship will endure you? And will he not pitch you overboard as a useless thing, an impediment only and bad example to the other sailors? And so it is here also. Every man's life is a kind of warfare, and it is long and diversified. You must observe the duty of a soldier and do everything at the nod of the general, if it is possible divining what his wishes are. For there is no resemblance between that general and this, neither in strength nor in superiority of character. You are placed in a great office of command and not in any mean place, but you are always a senator. Do you not know that such a man must give little time to the affairs of his household, but be often away from home, either as a governor or one who is governed, or discharging some office, or serving in war, or acting as a judge? Then do you tell me that you wish, as a plant, to be fixed to the same places and to be rooted? Yes, for it is pleasant. Who says that it is not? But a soup is pleasant, and a handsome woman is pleasant. What else do those say who make pleasure their end? Do you not see of what men yon have uttered the language? That it is the language of Epicureans and Catamites? Next, while you are doing what they do and holding their opinions, do you speak to us the words of Zeno and of Socrates? Will you not throw away as far as you can the things belonging to others with which you decorate yourself, though they do not fit you at all? For what else do they desire than to sleep without hindrance and free from compulsion? And when they have risen to yawn at their leisure, and to wash the face, then write and read what they choose? and then talk about some trifling matter being praised by their friends, whatever they may say, then to go forth for a walk, and having walked about a little to bathe, and then eat and sleep, such sleep as is the fashion of such men. Why need we say how? For one can easily conjecture. Come, do you also tell your own way of passing the time which you desire? you who are an admirer of truth and of Socrates and Diogenes. What do you wish to do in Athens? The same, or something else? Why then do you call yourself a Stoic? Well, but they who falsely call themselves Roman citizens are severely punished. And should those who falsely claim so great and reverend a thing and name get off unpunished? Or is this not possible? But the law, divine and strong and inevitable, is this, which exacts the severest punishments from those who commit the greatest crimes. For what does this law say? Let him who pretends to things which do not belong to him be a boaster, a vainglorious man. Let him who disobeys the divine administration be base and a slave. Let him suffer grief, let him be envious, let him pity, and in a word, let him be unhappy and lament. Well then, do you wish me to pay court to a certain person? To go to his doors? If reason requires this to be done for the sake of country, for the sake of kinsmen, for the sake of mankind, why should you not go? You are not ashamed to go to the doors of a shoemaker, when you are in want of shoes, nor to the door of a gardener, when you want lettuces, and are you ashamed to go to the doors of the rich when you want anything? Yes, for I have no awe of a shoemaker. Don't feel any awe of the rich, nor will I flatter the gardener, and do not flatter the rich. How then shall I get what I want? Do I say to you, go as if you were certain to get what you want? And do not I own?